Check this out. This is the coolest thing I've worked on for a while. It looks weird. It looks absolutely ancient, even though it wasn't actually made that long ago. So obviously it's from the Soviet Union. This is an early form of a plasma screen. And I've been using it to do some extremely Soviet things. And yeah, here it is, the MS6205 display. S, because it's actually Cyrillic, even though I've typed a letter C in the description. Uh, here it is, doing the most Soviet thing I thought possible. It is visiting the Oryx vehicle tracker and tracking the number of total destroyed Russian vehicles. The time of filming, it's already higher than what's on the screen there. Uh, yeah, they're going at quite a rate. What else have I been doing with this? Uh, well, obviously, what's the next most Soviet thing I could think of? Tetris. Here it is. Here's me having a go at it. I've hooked up three buttons there. Um, of course, it's extremely janky Tetris because I was pretty limited. And to be honest, I couldn't be bothered programming Tetris properly on this. So it works, kind of, except for when it doesn't. The easiest way to explain how these displays work is to kind of follow the whole tech tree. So we're all familiar with neon lamps. Um, I have a simple mock-up of one here. So they consist of a glass envelope, a glass tube filled with neon gas. And there are two electrodes passing inside. So if we apply a positive voltage to one electrode and the other one to ground, usually quite high voltage, 200 volts or so, um, what happens is the, the neon gas inside um, will actually start to glow. Uh, I won't go into this, there's a pretty bad mock-up of some glowing here, but you get the idea. Um, I won't go into the physical reasons for this, but basically applying a high voltage across neon gas in the right conditions causes it to glow. So with that knowledge, we then move on to Nixie tubes, which I've talked about at length before. So it's exactly the same principle, just arranged slightly differently. So in this mock-up here, we have the same glass envelope full of neon. The first electrode at the front here the anode is a grid with a number of cathodes, one shaped like each number. So applying the correct voltage this time will cause the gas around each one of these cathodes to glow and the glow will follow the shape of the cathode so you will get a nice number displayed. Now the matrix display is basically just a Nixie tube just arranged in a different format. So here, here, here it is. So what we have now is imagine flattening out the glass tube to make a this large flat glass tube. And we have a series of anodes. So these are these horizontal wires here. So they pass above a series of cathodes which are represented by the vertical wires. So exactly the same principle as before. By applying a positive voltage to the correct anode and connecting the correct cathode to ground, we can make a point light up. So in the example here, I have this, let me just check, <laughs> this anode pulled to, um, pulled to high voltage, in our case 240 volts, and cathode, this one here, this one here, and this one here connected to ground. So that will cause the intersection between them to glow. So we have three points glowing here. Looking at it from the side, what's happening? is the anode is at 240 volts. These three cathodes go to ground, which causes electrons to flow from the cathodes to the anode at the top and causes this small area here to glow. So by doing that, by indexing properly, it could cause any point on this within the glass envelope to glow. Therefore, we have a display. So if you actually buy one of these displays, I thought it was worth showing what it looks like in the box. They, they come actually surprisingly well packaged. So, so here it is in the middle, um, just getting it out there. And then at the side, there's some quite interesting bits of paperwork. So first of all, you get two uh, user manuals. Uh, there's one there in Russian, which I've been trying my best to translate, and another in Ukrainian. Um, more on that in a second. Um, so this is what interested me the most. You get these really nice looking schematics and they're, they're surprisingly good and surprisingly useful. I don't speak a word of Russian, but these, these have been really, really handy for me trying to figure, figure this thing out. So I'm sort of just going through some of them here. 
Um, yeah, they look kind of different to schematics that I'm used to, but I don't know if that's because they're old or because they're, they're Soviet. I, I don't really know. Right, let's have a look inside. This is the important stuff. Um, so while I'm just faffing around with it here, getting it open, notice on the back there, the date, 1995. So this might be Soviet design, but it was built four years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is actually one of the last ones built, as far as I can figure out. Um, but yeah, interesting to see something so old produced well into the 90s. Um, I was going to start laughing at it, to be honest, but as soon as you get inside and look at the circuitry, it honestly doesn't look too antiquated. Um, so we get this, this nice metal cover off here, a uh, little bit of faffing around from me there. Um, we'll just wait for me to, to struggle around with that there. And there's three circuit boards inside. So depending on what version you buy, this may, may vary somewhat. So these later versions just have the three boards, um, stacked on top of each other like this. So now I'm going to faff around for ages with these pillar supports. Uh, I'll, I'll speed up here and don't laugh too much at me using multi-tools to pry them apart. I'm going to replace them with more modern ones because they're all rusted, so I wasn't too worried about them. So I'll just speed up here. Okay, that's that finally apart. So we can see the top two circuit boards here, um, and they are they're quite interesting. So looking at the board on the right, um, th I'm just going to pause the video here actually, so we we can get a proper look. This uppermost board is kind of um, a logic board um, for the inputs to get them in in the correct format for the anode and cathode keys. Um, so we see the the connector on the right hand side of the board. Uh, that's where all of our, our raw inputs go. Now, most of the um, ICs on here, I'm not too interested in. They varieties of hex decoders and things that, honestly, I, I don't really care about. The two that are of interest are up at the top there. So we have uh, an EEPROM, uh, one of these ones with, with a window where you'd use a UV light to clear it. I've never seen one of these in real life before. Um, so that EEPROM, the signals go in, into these um, serial signals go in, in there and that stores each of the characters each of the latin and cyrillic characters along with numbers um, so the inputs are translated to the appropriate outputs for each number or letter to be fed to the next the next board um, and they'd light up the appropriate anodes and cathodes next to that eprom is also a ram uh, chip i believe um, again i'm not too worried about what that exactly does it essentially stores um pages to be shown on the screen because it has it has a storage capability i'm not worried about that for my purposes the other point of interest is the bottom left so all the components down there that is the step up from 12 to 240 volts now in the next video i'm going to be removing most of that this board on the right but i'll be using the the voltage converter and that's about it i'm going to be bypassing the ram and everything at the eprom and everything else so moving on to the uh, cathode board. Hi, future Alex here. Um, in this next section, I mixed up anodes and cathodes. So for clarity, the middle board or the one we're about to look at is actually the anode driver board that pulls the inputs up to 240 volts. The bottom board or the second one we'll look at is the cathode driver board that connects the cathode inputs to ground. I always mix up anodes and cathodes. I can't believe I've done it again. Um, so this second board down is connected via ribbon cables that we saw earlier to the, to the cathode inputs on the screen. Now this board takes the outputs from the ROM through those white wires that connect the two boards. So the three, if you like, 
central points of this board are these three transistor arrays. So what they do is they take the output from the ROM and connect the appropriate cathodes to ground. It's actually quite simple. Um, so then we can move on to the board below, which is pretty much the same thing, actually. Now, we, we can't actually see the anode board here. I can't um, disconnect it because of those ribbon cables. So we'll just have a look at the schematic here. But what it does is basically the same thing. It's, it takes the inputs to the screen, um, again, 0 to 100 little tabs there, one for each anode, um, and it consists of a number of transistor arrays. And again, um, a, a 5 volt input on those transistors will apply 240 volts to each anode as appropriate. And again, those transistors are switched on or off according to the output from the board on the top from that ROM there. Um, so yeah, it, it's actually quite simple in principle. Actually getting the display to show text from a web page is not as difficult as you might think it is. Um, so that's partially because somebody else has written the code to, uh, to put text on the display using, using Arduino. Uh, there's a link in the, in the description below to the GitHub page for that. Um, this display in its current form is designed solely to display text, so that makes life easier. So all I had to do was connect up a suitable microcontroller and use uh, this existing library. So I've just used an ESP32 because they have built-in Wi-Fi capability. Um, that goes via a shift register. And most importantly, the wiring diagram showing how to connect to the existing connector on the display is also provided at the GitHub page. So it was no real work for me, that, to be honest. Um, then I wrote some, some code. Now, I did have to write it in Arduino because the library is in Arduino and... Anyone that's heard me speak at length before knows how much I like to criticise that. There's nothing wrong with Arduino, it's great. But I'm a Python programmer normally, so I just find it difficult and strenuous and stressful. Um, that's why the Tetris doesn't work very well, because trying to deal with 2D arrays in Arduino is horrible. I hate it. I'd rather use NumPy. It's easy then. Get to that in the next video. But anyway, um, so my code, it would normally talk to an API to pull... Up the appropriate text data. Um, the Oryx vehicle tracker doesn't have an API, so this is where the Python programming side comes out again. There's no way I was going to start text crawling using Arduino. I'm just, I just don't know how to do that. It'd take me ages. So the second part of the project is very simple, actually. It is just an API which pulls the, the website and does the text processing for me. Um, so then the ESP32 talks to that API which runs from a Raspberry Pi. So there's a Docker image included on my repository. So what anyone wanting to do this, there's full instructions there, but what you have to do is uh, install that Docker image onto a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi will then pass the website, provide the relevant text via the API, and the ESP32 makes get requests to the API to get the actual numbers, the vehicle numbers, this could, of course, be used for any website. You could put any information you want and display it to the screen. As I've said several times, I just chose to do destroyed Russian vehicles because it's ironic and quite funny. One more thing I should say as well is if you do choose to make this or something similar, make sure you go to Oryx's website, link below, um, and give him a donation. He has a donation link near the top of the page. There's also one on his Twitter as well. Also be considerate. I make one request to the website every five minutes to get the data. Um, I wouldn't do any more than that. We don't want to overwhelm the website. Uh, we don't want to accidentally DDoS Oryx. He's providing a valuable service. And just in case you are wondering why the display sat awkwardly on this corner of my desk resting on a book, that's because the wiring looks like this at the moment. I'm not going to be leaving it in, in this current form. In fact, I'm planning to convert it to something far more capable. I've mentioned in passing already bypassing the EEPROM here, and I've mentioned that I'm planning on doing more with this display. So what I want to do in the next video is convert it to full graphical capability. These MS6205s are designed just to display text. Now I think that by bypassing most of the top board, I should be able to do that. Not all of the anode and cathode lines are, 
are um, connected to the above board. So I'm going to have to put together a custom PCB to connect up the remaining connections, but it doesn't seem too difficult. What doesn't fill me with confidence is I found two other folk that have tried this and they sort of just disappeared and never really gave an update. But it doesn't seem too intimidating to me. As long as I can get 240 volts across every anode line and connect every cathode line to ground, in theory, I can light up any pixel. So I might either be about to find out something about this display that I'd not anticipated, or hopefully soon we'll have another video with me playing Doom on this display. So uh, tune in in the next few months, hopefully, and I'll, uh, I'll get an update out.